it's great it's great to uh, be introduced by a young scientist award this is one of the most prestigious award worldwide also the ERC women so uh is not on it should be on the green one one two three even closer this is better okay so we see that the, the technical problems are always the same huh? we were commenting uh, uh with the uh uh, uh, previous DG directors, uh, future DG director, where do you go? Uh, and uh, myself, uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's a great, uh, uh, great uh, opportunity to be with you and uh, to spend uh, a moment <clears throat> yeah, be, uh, to talk about the upgrade. In fact, the upgrade is over. Uh, 2023 was the last year in which we received an exceptional contribution so that we received since 2009 from our council to implement the upgrade and the EBS, which is part of the upgrade, is what we refer sometimes to phase two. Uh, thanks to the users organization for inviting me and it's great to see this uh, beautiful users meeting, uh, the involvement of the user office uh, for, uh, its, uh, uh, for its organization. And of course, a big thanks uh, to all the uh, sponsorship from uh, the uh, different companies uh, that uh, this visit on the first floor. So, um, okay, choose the own way. So, um, what is moving all this? Um, I think that one of the key success of uh, ESRF asynchronous radiation in general is uh, the direct involvement of users uh, from the beginning in defining uh, the need of X-rays to uh, uh, develop uh, uh, the science uh, uh, that uh, would be done at this facility. And what is the science of our X-rays uh, and in particular synchrotrons? Um, we have seen already a few beautiful examples this morning. Uh, we're gonna hear it in the uh, micro symposia tomorrow, but also this afternoon, is uh, to realize that the X-rays are a fantastic probe uh, to determine the structure, in some cases also the dy dynamics of matter or the evolution of structure and that our world is very complex. It starts with atoms, so we are a world of atoms, and uh, these atoms combine themselves in uh, uh, infinite numbers of ways uh, to produce all that beauty that is around us and uh, the uh, growth of mankind in uh, being able to do uh, better materials, better processes, better functioning, better, better medications, et cetera, and et cetera. And all this is... Uh, is, uh, 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 I think, the big challenge of X-rays is to really go from the single atom uh, all the way to a working body, for example, in biology. But this applies uh, essentially to every area of science. Uh, if we look at uh, materials and processing, if we look at physics today, uh, the uh, complexity that is developing, for example, with uh, uh, AI algorithms in addressing uh, um, problems that, that we thought were impossible to really solve, although we were able to write the equations. Or if you look at the environment and sustainability or the complexity of uh, uh, um, matters at different conditions that, uh, uh, you know, exemplified here uh, in, uh, in looking just at the extreme conditions that we have in the core of our planet and all the effects that, that these different um, conditions have all the way up in the geophysics of Earth and how this determines also directly the life cycle. So um, all this uh, since years now uh, is really pushing us for uh, developing a new generation of X-ray microscope. And if I look at a talk that I gave uh, at the users meeting in 2004, um, uh, this uh, view graph uh, taken exactly from that meeting. This is the first time that we were starting to talk about uh, the uh, possibility of uh, uh, upgrading the ESRF. ESRF started this operation in 94, 10 years after. We were already talking about the next big step. And uh, there were two uh, buzzwords, decreased horizontal emittance and long insertion device beamlines for micro and nanofocus with X-ray 
absorption and scattering. And if I take another one, is a really, again, a, a, an attempt to bring together a very diverse community uh, to develop a, a science case that uh, could really be exploited uh, thanks uh, to this uh, technology development uh, on the machine and on the beam lines. And this was also the time in which we were starting to learn how to really manipulate X-rays uh, uh, down to, to a, a very, very uh, uh, small detail. And uh, already in 2004, we were seeing that the future is uh, routinely below one micro. And also, if we were looking there, uh, all the uh, elements that I put in my first view graph were there and really trying to converge the classic X-ray methods of absorption and scattering with uh, 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 microscopy. And uh, examples were already being pioneered at that time in terms of microdiffraction, extreme conditions that really was born here at ESRF, as well as microdiffraction and microanalysis. So um, the Council of the ESRF uh, decided in uh, uh, November 2008, uh, Bill Stirling was the Director General of the ESRF and was a key person in uh, driving the whole process uh, for uh, launching the upgrade program. Uh, and again, the whole process was based on science. And we find the nanoscience and nanotechnology such as biology and soft matter, ultra-fast molecular processes, science at extreme condition, and X-ray imaging. So again, everything was uh, you know, driven by this uh, key science that has been growing uh, since then. And uh, as we will see uh, in this user's meeting, but also in a couple of view graphs, um, uh, is uh, really driving the process for um, uh, the continuation of X-ray science. So all that uh, gave us uh, the possibility to develop uh, the phase one of the upgrade program that uh, um, uh, spanned over the period 2009-2015, was on the ESFI roadmap, uh, benefited from uh, 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 European uh, Commission money that financed the uh, preparation phase with a program ESRF up that also uh, enable uh, the publication of the um, uh, Purple Book, uh, where the science and technology case for the ESOF upgrade program was uh, presented, was uh, one of the first pillar in the uh, in the S3 roadmap, and uh, there was a very strong uh, uh, involvement of Yves Petrov at the time that was part of the um, S3 group in uh, making sure that the ESOF uh, could be uh, supported together with its users community. So. There were two main objectives, beamlines for nanoscience and the study for possibly a new high brilliance machine with uh, uh, strongly decreased uh, horizontal emittance and uh, correspondingly increased brightness. This was done, Golden's lab, very long beamlines. Uh, we uh, develop uh, the first open access cryo EM platform we just uh, heard from uh, the previous talk, uh, this was, uh, you know, again, a pioneer in everything. The beamline was successfully delivered. Uh, the users pro uh, they are in users program since 2015. All this, this was done in time in, in uh, budget. And if I quote uh, the ESRF Council at this uh, 2015 meeting, the Council celebrated the delivery of the ESRF upgrade program phase one, which has been completed on time within budget and with minimal impact on the operation of the facility and the ongoing users program. It recognized that the skill, competence, and dedication of the ESRF staff have been the key to the successful uh, delivery. And so this is also um, a, a way to uh, really underline the engagement of all ESRF staff over these many years uh, to really um, uh, develop as a big family together with the users community um, the ESRF as it stands today. But as I said, it was not just the beamline, it was also the development, the, 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 the study and the analysis on seeing whether uh, a new uh, revolutionary source uh, could be, in principle, uh, developed. And in fact, uh, um, already in the phase one, uh, there were some studies on how to extend uh, 
we'll see in a moment, uh, the, the MBA concept uh, to uh, uh, beyond the double bent achromat, which was the basis of ESRF1 and many other machine around the world. In uh, 2012, at the three-way meeting, uh, we at the SRF started uh, uh, the process with a brainstorm on the future electron high energy storage ring for the production of synchro radiation, a new generation of circular machine, the scientific case, why we need them. So that started at that point and developed rapidly uh, into um, an important meeting that again took place in uh, Zurich, uh, close to Zurich. The first one for the launch was in Zurzak, so Z uh, uh, again. Uh, this took place in uh, September 2012. Uh, you can see here the people that participated to that meeting and uh, this working group it was established by the council, made a recommendation. The working group has identified the upgrading of accelerator and sources to the new levels of brilliance that can be envisaged today as the key element to give ESRF the long-term opportunity to remain world-leading synchronous radiation science. It therefore, strongly recommends to the ESRF Council to give the mandate to the management to prepare a preliminary design on the upgrading of the ring. So that's how it all started, rapidly developed on uh, uh, what were the uh, uh, basis for the uh, conception of this new EBS storage ring, reduce the horizontal equilibrium emittance from 4 nanometers to less than 150, maintain uh, the existing ID straights and beam lines, maintain as much as possible the existing bending magnet beam lines, preserve the time structure operation and multi bunch current of 200 milliamps, keep the present injector complex, uh, reuse as much as possible existing hardware, minimize the energy loss in synchronous radiation, minimize operation cost, and mainly wall plug power. This was in 2013, huh? well before the crisis. Uh, this was been always a concern at the ESOF uh, to try to optimize uh, and uh, to reduce carbon footprint and other uh, aspect in energy consumption. Limit, the, of course, the downtime for installation and commissioning to about one year. And uh, <coughs> that's how, uh, from the phase one, we went to, to this uh, second phase, uh, the ESRF EBS, extremely brilliant source, with a budget of about 150 million euros. It immediately entered as a landmark in 2016, and is the first of a future generation of a high energy synchrotron sources. There were also new flagship beam lines and uh, 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 resuming some detection instrumentation and data service uh, uh, programs. Um, so, what's new about the, the EBS and why it was, uh, it is uh, such a revolutionary design and step for synchronous radiation? Uh, the um, the uh, third generation sources um, are based all on uh, lattice that was invented by Charlesman and Green in 1972 at Brookhaven. It's called uh, the double bent achromat and has the characteristic of uh, minimized. Um, uh, emittance fluctuation, um, uh, 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 not emittance fluctuation, but the flu beam size fluctuations all around the ring, and in particular provide a beam along a long straight section with a more or less constant characteristics and therefore optimal conditions for uh, insertion devices. Um, one could extend uh, this concept of double band achromat, and that's what uh, did Einfeld they did in 1993 uh, by increasing uh, the number of uh, bending magnets, and uh, uh, therefore um, uh, use this concept of increasing the number of bending magnets to reduce horizontal emittance. And this design, this approach was taken by Max Four and Sirius, and the aim was uh, pretty obvious uh, since uh, the 90s that uh, from going from third generation, one could gain a lot uh, and going then to what is now referred to as fourth generation by taking the basically line source that you have uh, in a third generation source uh, where you have a ratio of about 1000 between vertical and horizontal emittance to something that is much more cylindrical uh, and in which uh, the horizontal and vertical emittance are more or less uh, the same. This was studied at length at the ESRF uh, uh, in, uh, before the launching of the upgrade, as well as uh, during the phase one. 
Pascale Luom uh, did a lot of studies on that, on a possible triple band or four band acromat lattice for the ESRF based on the MVA concept. However, it went, it came out that uh, upgrading a machine to, uh, that was conceived on a DBA into an MBA is very, very difficult unless uh, you um, uh, renounce to some key features, like, for example, the energy of the machine. Um, as you would get unstable operation and pure injection efficiency due to the small dynamical aperture. And also you run into focusing optics with the technological non-accessible uh, field gradient of something like 7,000 uh, Tesla meter square, for example, for sextuples that are a key element of the MBA lattice. So uh, it was rapidly concluded that there was no real interest to upgrade any existing high energy storage ring uh, facility. Uh, this is uh, the DBA lattice. Uh, this is one cell. It is about uh, 25 meters long and uh, uh, is the ESRF cell. Uh, uh, was uh, first built uh, at the ESRF in 1994. And as I mentioned, is the basis of, of all uh, uh, third generation sources and existing storage ring around the world. This is the MBA. So basically you take one cell, uh, you multiply it and uh, uh, was first built in 2015 uh, with MAX4. Um, and uh, you increase uh, the number of dipoles, you reduce the fields, and this uh, 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 allows you, due to the cubic dependence on the field of the dipole on, on the energy, uh, on the spatial spread of uh, the electron beam, and therefore the horizontal emittance, and then you cure introducing dipoles and quadrupoles and octopoles in order to keep the beam small. However, as I mentioned before, uh, an upgrade of ESRF in this direction would have requested some major modification like reducing the energy of the storage ring from 6 GV to 4 GV and therefore changing completely the science phase. And that's what uh, is the uh, new concept that was introduced by Pantaleo Raimondi in 2013 the hybrid multiple band ac acromat is still a multiple band acromat because it uses the concept of increasing the number of dipoles to bend less and, uh, um, and uh, uh, by lowering the field and uh, having more dipoles to get uh, the same angular uh, bent uh, to reduce the horizontal emittance. But uh, he found a very smart solution, which is uh, basically a uh, uh, based on a E minus E uh, transformation that uh, introducing uh, uh, for the first time um, uh, uh, elements uh, uh, of uh, uh, nonlinear optics and a very advanced analysis of the, uh, the lattice, I don't want to go into the details, it basically uh, can come up for the ESRF with a design that, that also as compared to the uh, uh, MBA as a performances that are at least a factor two, if not more, better. And there are um, many, many advantages. So you have uh, the seven bending magnet that are key for get uh, the horizontal emittance and all a series of, of other aspects that you can uh, look in the detail in a paper that I'm going to uh, cite at the end of this uh, presentation. But altogether, you have a fewer sextuple than in a DBA in other words, a six sextuple instead of seven in a double band ac acromat, meaning less sextuples as compared to the old ESRF. Longer and weaker dipoles, so this produces much less synchronous radiation. No need of large dispersion in the inner dipoles. And so this is allow you uh, to reduce uh, drastically the number of magnets in, uh, uh, as compared to uh, a seven band acromat lattice. In fact, if we compare the cell, you know, in the previous years of cell, we had 17 uh, uh, magnets. In the EBS uh, um, lattice cell, we have uh, 31 magnets. If we would have applied the seven band acromat the max four lattice cell, we would have 47 magnets with the magnetic fields much, much higher than that. So you can see that despite the big simplification that, uh, uh, that the EBS lattice enable us uh, as compared to the uh, MBA, uh, you still have a very complex uh, uh, cell with much more uh, elements and all a series of extremely new concept in accelerator technology that were uh, studied and implemented here at the SRF. 
And all this uh, to enable you uh, to have uh, increase in brilliance, thanks to the reduced horizontal emittance of the order of 100, plus, uh, 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 and even much higher if you move uh, to high energy. And this is uh, the fact that, that uh, higher uh, emittance, uh, sorry, uh, lower emittance not only allows you to get brilliance from the fact that you have a much smaller source size, but also because you can easily develop new concept of uh, use of ondulators, and we will see that also in a moment. If I look at the coherence, also the coherent flux goes up uh, basically proportionally to the red reduced, uh, inversely proportional to the reduced horizontal emission. So all this uh, uh, brought us uh, to the uh, uh, ESRF EBS. Here you see uh, the previous source and the new source. So there's a factor of 10 reduction here in the, in the, in the scale. Uh, you see that we are not perfectly circular. Uh, there is a still a mismatch between the vertical and the horizontal, but this has been reduced by roughly a factor of 50 as compared uh, to the uh, uh, previous uh, machine where the ratio was a factor of uh, 1,000. And if you see, the big changes are only there, the horizontal emittance and the, the two-shake lifetime, because, of course, you are uh, sharply increasing the density in the bunch. All the other parameters, like uh, ring energy, uh, vertical emittance, uh, beam current, uh, stay the same. And so all this uh, enabled us uh, to go into uh, the full construction phase uh, that developed in the period of 2015 to uh, 2018, uh, in parallel with the user service mode with the previous machine. Then we had uh, a shutdown of about uh, 20 months that uh, saw a first part uh, for the uh, dismounting and installation of the new hardware and uh, roughly uh, 10 months for uh, uh, the commissioning of the new machine. Uh, and remember that uh, this was also the year in which uh, um, we had uh, the COVID uh, that uh, started in uh, March uh, 2020 and obliged us, uh, in fact, uh, to reduce uh, all a series of activities uh, uh, during this uh, crucial year for uh, the ESO. Uh, the new storage ring is uh, uh, made of cell. Uh, each cell contains uh, 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 four girders. Um, uh, they are uh, specularly symmetric with respect to the center. Uh, you see here the first one and the last one, if you take the specular image. And I show this because you can see a concentrate of technology, a lot of issues in terms of vibration, resonances, and, and so on, were pushed away. Uh, and this is all thanks to the experience gained on the previous storage ring. But here there is a, a key element. The key element is this uh, uh, blue uh, magnet. This is uh, uh, a dipole with a, a longitudinal gradient. So it's a uh, a, a combined function uh, 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 magnets that is all made by permanent magnets. This was uh, um, made uh, by Joel Chavan and his group, uh, the IDM group here at the SRF, that in fact uh, took care of the design and uh, um, delivery of all the uh, different uh, uh, elements uh, of uh, this new uh, storage. So this is, uh, I think, a uh, uh, historical picture, 801 on uh, 10th of December, 2018. No beam, you see the dark. This is the last beam with the previous machine, uh, just before that, uh, that, uh, that uh, crucial moment. This is uh, at 8 o'clock, uh, all ESRF had a breakfast on the mezzanine, uh, 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 celebrating the end of operation of the previous machine and starting this uh, new very intense period for the construction of uh, the new storage ring. So the race started on, uh, and uh, um, this was uh, the situation on uh, 10th of December, 2018. Uh, this is the, the storage ring uh, tunnel with the previous machine. And uh, after uh, less than a year, after 11 months, uh, that's uh, what we had in the, in, the, in the tunnel. It took 11 months. Uh, to take out uh, the previous storage ring, uh, to do some civil construction inside the, tu the tunnel, and to mount uh, the new storage ring, uh, get the vacuum system, uh, get all the services in place, uh, and uh, basically being ready uh, for uh, starting the commission. And indeed, uh, the commissioning started on 28th 
of November 2019. This was an historical moment because after a few minutes, we could see the first turn turns inside uh, the storage ring. Here, uh, only the dipoles were either uh, turned on because they were electromagnets or the one made out of uh, permanent magnets. You can see here the 320 beam position monitors are, are along the circumference of the ring. You can see here signal that is basically fading down. Uh, and these are the first three turns of electrons inside the, uh, the storage ring. This was uh, all uh, uh, based on uh, static alignment. All the magnets uh, uh, enabling uh, this immediate success to confirm that they were aligned with a precision of about uh, 20 microns over the whole uh, circumference, about 900 meters. So really a fantastic job that was carried out by our survey and alignment group. <clears throat> and uh, uh, after a few days on uh, 6th of December, Okay, beam stored. This is uh, the, the RF was turned on. Uh, the, uh, the, the magnets family were started to be optimized using all a series of optimization algorithms. And uh, you could see here the, the, the first uh, attempts and uh, the first uh, uh, um, storage of uh, electrons. The current was still pretty, pretty low, something like 30 microamps. But you could also see this beam, this beam which really looks good, that this is random. This is, uh, is this, uh, sorry, uh, round. And uh, what you see here is, is, is I took it with my iPhone, and so what's moving is my hand. Uh, you see immediately uh, something very, very crucial, that this beam is incredibly stable. You see this object there on the screen, and it's not moving. It's not going anywhere. And this is you know, just after the first few attempts. After a few days, uh, the gang uh, was able uh, to do the first accumulation. This is the next big step. Okay, we have a store beam at 30, uh, 30 microamps. Can we start uh, increasing the current? And so you need uh, uh, to, uh, to start to be able uh, to accumulate beam. And this happened on Sunday, of course. All thing, big things happen on Sunday. 15th of December at uh, 15.35. And that's where really the fun started. And uh, after a few, uh, after the, the, the winter shutdown, uh, just before the, the winter shutdown on 15th of December, we accumulated and then we came back on January 24th and they were able to, to reach basically no time, uh, 50 milliamps. And 50 milliamps is also a crucial current because it's the current that we set as the current in which we will start to open again the front ends of the beam line. And that's what happened uh, uh, indeed at the end of uh, uh, January. It was on the 30th of January. And uh, basically, the first light was seen by all the different beam lines. And uh, what was absolutely amazing uh, that uh, we basically opened uh, uh, 27 beam line on that date. And uh, 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 all of them found the beam within a fraction of a millimeter with respect to, to where the beam was before the shutdown with the old storage. So you, you can realize the competence and the, the marvelous work that everybody has done. Uh, and uh, one month after, 28th of February, 200 milliamps. So basically, uh, the key parameters so to consider the EBS storage ring uh, ready for user exploitation were reached uh, more or less uh, uh, six months ahead of schedule. Uh, and, uh, and this was also a crucial time, a crucial date, because um, many of us remember that France entered into a very uh, unique uh, time on uh, 11th of March with, a, with, a, with basically a COVID imposed uh, stop of all activities uh, and uh, people being uh, uh, obliged to stay home. As well as the DSRF for uh, about two months, this was the situation. Uh, however, um, a minimum of activity was maintained and uh, this enabled us, in fact, uh, to continue uh, the uh, uh, commissioning of uh, some uh, basic elements and again here, you can see uh, uh, the record value emittance very close uh, to uh, 
already to the, uh, to the uh, design value. Uh, I also want to point out that, uh, you know, the, uh, in, the, in the operation at the beginning, uh, we were uh, also having a very small coupling between horizontal and vertical. And for the first time, I've been told in uh, accelerator fields that we uh, measured vertical emittance in the femtometers of uh, 0 0.5 picometers. Um, and uh, probably less uh, because this is the limit of our, uh, our uh, measuring system. Also, what was uh, amazing is uh, this are these pictures where you start seeing uh, really the theoretical uh, um, emission of uh, ondulated beams. This is uh, through monochromators, uh, different harmonics. You can see all these lobes and all these structures. It's uh, something that uh, was never seen before because they were completely masked by the very broad horizontal emittance of uh, previous machine. And uh, when uh, scientists started to uh, characterizing this beam, this is uh, ID 27, U35, you just see this incredibly sharp peak uh, with a full width half maximum of about 0.5%. So almost a, a monochromatic beam. So um, things uh, are really changing. This is a uh, uh, photon flux, a beam line ID, for a 27 millimeter period on the later. And uh, you can see also all the fringes uh, that uh, testify the degree of coherence of, uh, of, your, of your photon beam. Or on ID9, uh, where there is a, 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 a monochromator to work, uh, uh, sorry, an ondulator to work uh, possibly in pink beam. This is uh, what was available before in blue uh, with the uh, previous machine. With a new machine, you see this incredibly sharp peak, which is a factor 10 higher. This is the effect of a mirror, mirror and basically the ability with the mirror and with this ondulator to basically have a, a pink beam with 0.5% uh, 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 energy spread, uh, full width half max. Uh, with, with max. So really a, a, new, a new time started. And uh, the objective was to go back to USM in 2020. And this was uh, uh, on 25th of August, uh, 2020. And this was indeed possible, thanks also to uh, the fact that the summer, the uh, pandemic effect were kind of reduced. So uh, on uh, 25th of August, as of a program that was set in 2017, you could see uh, 200 milliamps and USM mode, and you can see all the beam lines that were open as planned on that particular date. And uh, ESRF today, that's the ESRF today. You see 2018, this is the last year of the previous machine, uh, 2020, the first year of operation. You could see that uh, there was uh, still some uh, important work to do but you can see a steady improvement and uh, the statistics for 2023 are shown here, 99.3 uh, uh, of uh, availability, 107 uh, basically almost four days, uh, more than four days of uh, uh, time between failures and average uh, duration of a failure of less, well below one hour. We also see that the user activity has uh, completely restarted uh, these are the uh, statistics for 2023, but uh, they are not over yet because uh, the 2023 ends in March. Um, you can see that we are back uh, to a number of uh, experimental sessions, which are very much comparable to the previous one. Uh, there was uh, an over-demand and overuse uh, at the, during the last three years uh, with the previous machine. And uh, uh, we have introduced new um, access mode and also there are still a few beam lines that are uh, to be delivered this year and next. So altogether, uh, this brings us to 2023, to this beautiful uh, uh, reconstruction of the ESRF, a landmark in the S, uh, on the S3 roadmap. What we got is a 27 new beam line. Uh, a new uh, first of a kind, the low emittance, high brilliance X resource. Um, we also invested a lot on uh, uh, data and IT infrastructure for supporting uh, the uh, uh, user's activity, new experimental facilities, 
we have uh, 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 energy saving of about 25% as compared to the previous machine, and we have been reusing about 90% of the existing infrastructure. So if you combine the effects of a new source, a new long meme lines, a new instrumentation, new data management tools, the experimental conditions, it depends on how you calculate it, goes to from a minimum of about a factor 100 to, uh, in some cases, even above a factor of 10,000. And at this factor 100 to 10,000, that really change the science reach. So this was the situation in 2004. This is the situation in 2024. You can see that there is a lot of continuity. It almost looks like nothing changed. But if you look a little bit more careful, you see new experimental hole here. And you see new beam lines over there. And uh, most of all, you see a new storage ring uh, inside, the, inside the, the tunnel. And I just want to mention, uh, we are in 2024. It's exactly 30 years from uh, the beginning of uh, USM operation at the SRF. So this is also an important date to celebrate with all of you, 30 years since uh, 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 this, uh, this uh, uh, historical event. I think Eva was uh, the DG at the, uh, at the time uh, in which uh, uh, the experimental hall uh, was uh, not only empty, but also trembling. And uh, uh, a lot of things, a lot of water went through the Isar River and the Drac River since then. Uh, but I think uh, that uh, today we have the same enthusiasm and the same opportunities as, as in 1994 with fantastic tools that can really uh, shape up the uh, X-ray uh, science in the coming years. And it's a quotation from Dave Stewart. But, um, you know, the ESOF uh, EBS is not just an internal success. I think it's a very important success worldwide because if we look at how we change uh, the scene uh, since the launching of EBS, uh, basically everybody is racing uh, to try to, uh, uh, to catch up. And uh, we have uh, some projects that, that are very advanced, like the one at PSI that is uh, under construction and soon into uh, commissioning. Argon, ATS app, uh, should come back to, use, to the users program in April. Uh, Spring 8 has been announced uh, to, uh, to go to an upgrade. We have a, a very similar um, uh, uh, ATS U ring in Beijing, which is also under commissioning. And also Petra 4 uh, will be built uh, by the end of this uh, decade. And also Trieste and many other projects that are progressing, uh, Berkeley, the Canadian light source, uh, Soleil 2, of course, uh, Diamond light source, uh, and so on. So um, I think it really changed uh, the scene because all these facilities would not have been impossible as for the ESOF to upgrade them using the MBA lattice concept. So without the HMBA, all this that happened at the ESOF and is going to happen soon will not be possible. And this is the paper that, if you are interested, that you can consult. is uh, Nature Communication Physics uh, that, uh, with the colleagues, we have uh, written in order to provide a little bit of a summary of uh, uh, the HMBA concept, uh, its uh, positioning as compared to other solution, and uh, um, the uh, promising future for the years. Last two view graphs I want to dedicate it to the science, uh, lifting uh, the potential of EBS. I do not have the time uh, to give you examples of science. You will see them uh, a little bit uh, uh, through this meeting and elsewhere. But for me, this is very impressive. This is incredible. The uh, ESRF didn't have any ERC contract until uh, the first one was uh, Hugh Simon uh, in uh, 2019. And all of them, all of them starting uh, uh, advanced consolidator are based on the exploitation of EBS. And so this really shows what it means to have a new door opening. At the end, it's you, the users, deciding if all that we have done is worth something. So this is for me the most impressive thing, and I am uh, truly and sincerely um, touched by the engagement of the users' community in exploiting all the work that here at the SRF we have been doing de facto for years. And I cannot resist uh, by this uh, fantastic endeavor uh, uh, that involves uh, UCL, involves uh, um, uh, ESRF, involves a series of German hospitals, but is more and more involving uh, 
something I think more than 40 collaborators uh, today around the world that are uh, using the unique capabilities of uh, ESRF, uh, which are used uh, in uh, phase contrast tomography to open a new vista in uh, uh, anatomy and understanding of the human body and the human organs. Uh, and uh, the launching of this human organ project, Atlas project, which has a very strong funding from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And it's really aiming at understanding human diseases thanks to a new insight into our body. Uh, 500 years after Leonardo, I think here we have something that I really hope is going to mark the, uh, uh, the understanding of humankind on the human body, on human body, on a different level as compared to before. Um, so uh, I also mentioned uh, the uh, a lot of work that has been done in optimizing the access. And I think this is uh, also a major accomplishment. And I don't go into the details, but it really uh, is aiming uh, to optimize the whole pipeline uh, for uh, uh, optimal use of EDS and all the different ESRF experimental stations. And with that, I want to conclude by basically saying that uh, uh, the upgrade program in general, but EBS and the chain BA lattice are really changing the paradigm in synchronous X-ray science and applications. Some applications much more applied, some others much more fundamental, as it should be for a probe that is really impacting uh, humankind. Uh, Beamlines for nanoscience, they are really setting a bridge to our understanding of the world of atoms in many, many different disciplines. Uh, there is a lot of work to be done for both adiabatic and disruptive improvements, both on the beamline side and the machine side. Uh, for example, many developments are required to reach and exploit fully the diffraction limited synchronous source, both in storage ring and beamlines. And I think we have a very exciting years ahead of us. What's next? Well, I think it's pretty obvious what's next. We need to start thinking probably now to the next big step, the storage ring based X-ray lasing. I think this is within reach, we can do it. And it's probably the project for the coming uh, two de decades. So I want to finish uh, with infinite thanks to all those who contributed to this uh, uh, presentation, but of course to the upgrade and uh, for their outstanding work. And a special thanks to Pantaleo. And also I take the occasion to thank all of, the, all, all of you that has contributed since the early 70s uh, to develop synchronous radiation science for mankind. I'm very uh, pleased uh, that even uh, Bill are with us uh, today. And of course also Jean and, uh, uh, and uh, all of you. And thank you uh, for, uh, uh, for, for listening. Thank you. <laughs>